Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for the incredible privilege of gathering together as a body of believers to worship and exalt you. And we pray that everything that we do today points others and ourselves to you, gets our hearts and minds focused on what you are wanting to do in our lives as we commune with you in this time of worship and seek to glorify your name for the great mercy and love that you have shown us. We ask all this in Jesus' holy and blessed name. Amen. Chelsea? All right, I'm here. So, as you can tell, we have a different group up here. So this is, you might recognize him, this is my nephew Camden and his praise band, they come from Grace Community Church. So we thought we would do something a little different, give them more experience, give us kind of a nice little interaction with them. So, this is Camden and his praise band. Yeah, good morning everybody. Um, We're gonna lead you in a time of worship if everybody could stand up if you're able. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all its ceiling. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Wonderfully made, you're in 
an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay You make all things work together For my future And for my good You make all things work together For your glory for your name There's a healing light Just beyond the clouds And though I've walked through fire I see clearly now And I know nothing has been wasted No failure or mistake You're in our and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. You make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for your Doubt, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. And I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. You make all things work together for my future. Potter, I'm the canvas and the clay, and I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. You're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. You're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay.
Welcome to South End. Uh, glad to see everyone here this morning. Um, if you are a visitor here, we have a connection card in the back of the pew racks. And uh, if you can fill that out and slip it in the offering plate or slip it in, slip it in the plates as you leave, um, those requests will be, uh, any prayer requests will be um, prayed upon throughout the week. Um, so if you would right now, uh, bow me, in, or bow me, join me in a word of prayer, please. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this beautiful sunshine that you give us this morning, Lord. We thank you for everything that you give us. And just pray, Lord, that you'd be with us. Be with Mike as he uh, leads us in the sermon today. Lord, I just pray that you give him the words to, uh, that you've given to him to, to speak. I thank you for all that you do. It's in your son Jesus' precious name that I pray. Amen. There's that awkward pause of silence, right? Everybody's like, what's going to happen next? We're funny about that, aren't we? With, with things, things go differently than we're used to, or there's silence. There's that kind of, it's just the way we are as people, I guess, one of those things. If you have your copy of God's Word, turn to 1 Peter chapter 4 with me. We're going to be finishing up the chapter. Believe it or not, we'll be through 1 Peter next week. And yes, we're going to go into 2 Peter for a few weeks, and then we'll kind of figure out where we're shifting from there. But anyway, that's what we're going to kind of be looking at here. 1 Peter 12 through 19 is where we are if you want to find that in your copy of God's Word. And as you're able, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word here for a few moments? 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19, as we hear as the apostles kind of winding down this letter uh, to the believers there in his part of the world back many, many, many centuries ago. And Peter says this, he says in verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rest on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if everyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. For it is... Time for the judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will it be for the what will be what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time that we have together to spend time in your word. And we pray, Father, today that as we walk through this text, Father, that the Holy Spirit guides us and leads us and enables us to hear what you have to say to us. Not so much what I have to say, Lord, but what the Holy Spirit desires to speak to us today, that our lives might be transformed, that we might become more pliable to be used for your purposes to accomplish whatever it is you desire in us and through us. We ask this in this time, Lord, that you bless us and use us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You, you may be seated. All right. So he kind of starts off here with a pretty challenging statement as we look in the text here and, and as Peter speaks to us and tells us here to, to do something a little bit different. How many of when you're dealing with a challenging situation are excited about it? Stress. How many like stress? 
Okay, just one of you. All right, wow, that's amazing. No, most of us don't. We don't like th- we don't like change very much. We kind of were joking about that down in the youth room, talking with ki- the kids a little bit. That's kind of one of those things we talk about. We don't like change. Change is hard for us as people. It's not just a Baptist thing, okay? I know we like to joke about that, but it is a struggle. And so sometimes that change we need to have in our lives is good, but we don't like it because it's different, and different is just different, right? Like when you go to the doctor... And the doctor says, we need to make some changes in your life, right? How many of you enjoy that? Nobody enjoys that. That usually means a change in diet, maybe increased exercise, or something that you've enjoyed or consistently done, you now have to stop or quit doing, right? And that's, this, that's something we don't like to experience. And yet in this text here, we see Peter reminding these believers that they're going to deal with what he calls a fiery ordeal. Does that sound like a good thing? I know we probably have some people out here there that enjoy fire. I enjoy fire to a degree, uh, but I don't want to be a part of a fiery ordeal because when I think of a fiery ordeal, I think of difficulty. I think of suffering. I think of pain because if you've ever been involved in a fire and putting it together or putting it out or whatever, sometimes if you're not careful, you get burned. Anybody ever been burned by a fire or something hot? Okay, a few, a few more of you have done that because that can happen pretty easy. When you get burned, what's the first response when you touch something hot that you do? Ouch! Or you, and your hand moves away. or if it's, Whatever it is that is close to the heat, it quickly has a recall response. So that's the way we've been made. It's amazing. I, I love that, that God did that about us. To avoid the pain, to avoid worse pain, we, we quickly get away from that. And it, that's, it works that way not just with fire, but with anything we deal with in life that is difficult. It's much easier for us to avoid the path of suffering than to endure the path of suffering. How many of you, and you, I know you're sick of me talking about traffic, but when you're driving in traffic, you choose the most difficult way. How many of you do that? You listen to the GPS and you say, okay, this way is going to take 45 minutes longer, so I'm going to go this way. No. You're looking for the easier way. We always are. That's part of human nature. We look for the things that cause less stress. One of the places where I've learned this the most is I've done, it's been a while since I've done it, but for many years I did a lot of canoeing. I would take youth on float trips every year, and so I've been on several rivers in our country, most in the Midwest, and it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. My wife, not so much, but I enjoyed it. And there's just something about when you're going down the river, you learn to let the current take you, and you learn to follow the current and take the path of least resistance, because if you do not, you're going to get in trouble. And if you don't follow the current, there can be, and even sometimes following the current, you can get in trouble because the current doesn't care there's a tree in the way. It just doesn't care. It's going to go through that. And if you aren't careful and don't know what you're doing, you're going to have issues. And that works in life sometimes too. If we just kind of say, well, I'll just live life the way I want to live. I'll just kind of go with the flow. Everything will be wonderful. That's not always true. But sometimes you have to deal with some challenges and difficulties in life. As Peter says here, Beloved, do not be surprised with a fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for what? He says, for your testing, as though some strange thing are happening. And whenever things don't go the way we expect, how do we usually respond? Why me? Why now? Why this? Don't we? Is everybody awake out there? I'm just curious. Y'all kind of like you're in a lull here. I don't know, maybe we had some, something that for breakfast that I didn't have. I don't know, that really has got you feeling that this morning. But anyway, as we go on here, he says, that's what we re- respond. We sometimes think that we're the only one. Have you ever felt that way, that you're the only one that had to go through something in life? I know that happens to a lot of us, but that's, we know that's not true. But we sometimes, in the middle of the stress, in the middle of the struggle, and that's what Peter's reminding his believers, don't worry about that, don't focus on that. But notice, and he shifts it, but understand this, in verse 13 he says, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ... Keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice in exaltation. Oftentimes, you and I will face things as we follow Jesus, and that is a part of us being a part of the sufferings of Christ. If you are faithful to follow him, there will be difficulties at times that will run you in opposition to the ways and structures of this life that we live in. And some of us have seen that to lesser degrees, but in other parts of the world, brothers and sisters see that in much greater degrees, that sometimes to do and be faithful to Christ means to put them at odds with those who are in control and those who can cause them great harm. And what Peter, and that's really the setting of what Peter's describing here, isn't it? We know this is the first century when this was shared, and as he's sharing these thoughts and wanting people to understand that, he knows they're going to run a ground of difficulty. So don't be shocked, don't be afraid, don't be scared, don't think, God, you've left me. No, oftentimes that is when God is with you. 
the most is when you're going through times of trial and difficulty. And in life, sometimes we're going to face those things. Sometimes those things are a result of our own failures and our own mistakes. But oftentimes, folks, they're just life. It's just the way it is, right? Life is a struggle. Life can be that way. And that's what I think Peter is trying to help these believers understand because sometimes we get caught up and we think that if we would just follow Jesus the way we're supposed to, everything would be wonderful, right? All our problems would be solved in 27 minutes like on a sitcom, right? Just be perfect. But reality, does life work that way? Anybody awake? Okay. Does life work that way? No, it doesn't. You ever notice that? Does anybody ever notice on TV that they solve the world's greatest problems in less than 23 minutes? Actually, 23. I said 27. It's 23 minutes is all that they have of actual. But you throw out the commercials and the whatever they have at the beginning and the whatever at the end. There's just a few minutes there. But they're able to solve these incredible problems of the world. I was a, you know, a, as a kid, I grew up watching the show Happy Days. You ever heard of it? You know, and, and it's that way. That's the way the show is. And, you know, it's, it's kind of comical. You know, Ron Howard's on there and and Henry Winkler plays the Fonz and all that. I won't do my bad Fonz impression, but there's all those things. But there's always some issue they face in the show. You know, there's, there's the, that's why, it's why drama works, right? You have a, kind of the introduction, and then you have this issue, whatever it is, some crisis, you know, and then you have to face the crisis, and the crisis has to be solved. But it's always got to be solved in that, that time frame. And life is a lot like that at times. You will face crises in life, won't you? You will face challenges and difficulties. In fact, Peter is warning them and telling them, you're going to face this. He calls it a fiery ordeal. You're going to face difficulties, but understand that when you face the difficulty, you're identifying with Christ. Because did not Jesus suffer when he lived on this earth before the cross? Did everybody think that when Jesus came and heard him talk, they were all like, yay, it's Jesus, right? What about those guys, those religious leaders, that every time Jesus says something, they they had to correct him? You remember them? There's always those situations. No matter what he does, they try to find fault in it. And in all the accounts, the many of the miracles, you'll see that after Jesus performs a miracle, they'll question why he did it, how he did it, when he did it, all these different things about it, or by whose power he did it, and they try to discredit him. One of the times I notice there's not a lot of that going on is at the resurrection of Lazarus. Are you familiar with that text? I believe that's John chapter 11. You can look it up later. But the resurrection of Lazarus, which is towards the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, it's really right near the end, right before the week of the, past, the weekend of the Passion, all that's going to take place that Jesus is going to endure. He's there. His friend has died, and there's all these people gather around, and he's been dead for a while. And, you know, they have this, you know, and his, his sisters are inconsolable. They're, they're upset, and they keep telling him, Lord, if you'd been here, you wouldn't have died. And he's like, I know, but, you know, and he says, but I'm the resurrection. But we believe that even if you, whatever you ask of God, God will do. And they're There's that faith that they have in spite of what they've seen and what they've experienced. And they're struggling trying to figure that out. And they're all these people are gathered around the tomb and they see the tomb and Jesus tells them to move the stone away. And you remember one of my favorite verses in the King James is is this way. I don't know if you, and this is my middle school guy in me, so I figure this will work. In the King James, it said, you know, he's talking to Martha and he says, remove the stone. And she says, but Lord, he stinketh. I love that. I don't know why. That's the middle schooler in me. You know, he's been dead for four days. Now, I'm not a doctor, but I know after a amount of time in that day, especially when they didn't do some of the things they were able to do, that the body's going to start decaying, and she was exactly right. There's going to be a stench. Jesus doesn't worry about that, does he? He doesn't focus on that. And everybody's watching this. They're all, I don't know how many, it doesn't tell us. There's probably hundreds of people out there that are there to support Martha and Mary during their time of loss. All these religious leaders who hate Jesus are out there as well. And Jesus simply walks up after they remove, after they open the tomb, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. That's all he says. And there's kind of that pause that we all love. And everybody's looking at that dark opening in the cave there where Lazarus is buried, and all of a sudden you see this figure coming out like Boris Karloff's mummy. Some of you will get that later. If not, you can Google it. So anyway... And he's kind of coming out because, I mean, he's bound. That's how they often bury people. They would bind them in cloths. And he's coming out, and then Jesus tells them to unbind him, to free him up. Now, what was that like, do you think, after that, that event for Lazarus? I mean, he had been dead for four days. 
What do you think he heard and saw and experienced in that time after he died? I mean, scriptures kind of allude to the fact that he was in Abraham's bosom as we know it. You know, he was, it wasn't truly heaven yet because that hasn't been perfected, made yet. That's being taken care of right now. But he is, he's been with God. He's been with the, the seen some of the people of God, hung out, done those kind of things. And all of a sudden, as he's experiencing that, he hears a voice. And the voice calls him out and he comes out and then he's alive again and he has this memories of, of what he's experienced and he's been dead and now he's alive. And yet what an image that is for those who come to follow Christ because before Christ, we are dead. Not physically, but spiritually. We are dead in our sin. We are trapped in a way of life that's all about us. We are self-centered, obsessed, and focused on us. Everything is about our comfort, about our protection, about our whatever. It's all about us. And coming to follow Jesus is about a change of life. It's what we call it being born again. You ever heard that term? Jesus uses that term in John 3. He reminds them that's what has to happen in your life. You are a changed person. You are a new creation. And Peter is reminding them here of that, that you have been changed and transformed. In fact, he even says in verse 14 that if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. How many of you like to be reviled? You know what reviled means? That's a nice, fancy religious word. You know, made fun of, slandered. How many of you like that? Nobody likes that. But if you had done that because of Jesus, rejoice. Because that means, he says, that the spirit of glory rests on you. It's a part of the deal in becoming a follower of Christ. This is a part we pastors sometimes don't talk about. Because we want to we sell the gospel message as something that you will buy, that you will want to be a part of. And we want to tell you all the good things. But there are sometimes some not so good things you'll experience as a follower of Christ. I'm just going to be honest with you. It will not be all a bed of roses. It will not be all perfect. It will not be all happy. It will not be a wonderful kumbaya experience. It will be sometimes very difficult. And you will experience loss. You will experience difficulty. You will experience pain and suffering. But you know what? God is faithful even through that to walk with you through it. And many of you have experienced that. You've walked with that in different settings of your life. You've lost loved ones. You've experienced pain. You've had suffering in your life. And you've seen God move you through it. And because God has moved you through it, you're a different person on the other side of that than you were before. That, doesn't that make sense? Does that happen to anybody else? And yet, we don't like to talk about that or think about it because we don't like pain. We don't like inconvenience and discomfort. We just don't. And that's not a bad thing. That's not. I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on you because we're all that way. That's one of the things that we do as human beings. But through those times, we have to understand God can use us. And that's part of what Peter is trying to, I think, help these brothers and sisters understand. He even says, now, some people suffer for doing wrong. He says that in verse 15. Make sure that none of you suffers because you're, he uses list of everything, murderer, thief, evildoer, troublesome meddler, none of these things that you do that are wrong. Don't suffer because of what you do wrong. Instead, I love this, as he says in verse 6, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, which is the exact opposite of that, he should not be ashamed, but it's to glorify God in this name. God has, has chosen you, has allowed you to suffer for his glory. I think there's an incident back in Acts, I believe it's in Acts chapter 2, when some of the followers of Christ are following God, and then they, they are faithful, and because they're faithful, they get thrown in prison. You know, no, my, I can't remember the exact, I'll have to look it up, because my brain does that sometimes. And they're out there, and they've done this, and they've been faithful, and yet because of their faithfulness, they're thrown in prison. But after they get out there, they rejoice in the fact that they were found worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. If I got out of prison, I don't know that I'd been rejoicing. I'd be rejoicing I'm out of prison, I guess, but rejoicing that I'd been found worthy to suffer for the name of my Savior. And yet that's the attitude that Peter's talking about here for all of us, that that's part of what it means to be faithful to him is to understand that there will be difficulty and in the difficulty we can trust him and the difficulty we choose to follow him no matter what it costs us. And that's hard, but that's what it means to be a follower of Christ. And Peter kind of then has this verse. It's kind of a verse as I look at it that I wonder, you know, this is how I'm, I'm grateful for the disciples and the way they write and the way they communicate. Him and Paul both, they got a little bit of ADD going on here. Because it's kind of like a shift. He's been going along, and then all of a sudden he throws this verse in there, this whole thing that kind of just doesn't quite fit. But the truth is, I think because of that, the truth is even more accentuated, more clear here. Notice what he said in verse, you see what he said in verse 17? For it is time to begin, for judgment to begin with the household of God. That's the first part of it. 
Why would God judge his people first? Why would he call, is there a time in the land today, a time in the church when maybe judgment needs to come upon the household of the faithful? Have we been all we're supposed to be in, as followers of Christ? I, I kind of doubt that. I think we've, we've messed up in a way or two. Is that fair? Sometimes we haven't lived up to those expectations, but he's describing that way back then, that this is what needs to happen. It begins with us first that we will be the outcome for those who do not obey. The, it, we are the ones that are responsible as followers of Christ. We, are, we have a greater sense of responsibility for keeping the words of this, of this book, for following our Savior, don't we? I mean, we have that responsibility as followers of Christ. If not, sometimes we talk to people who are outside the church and we expect them to live like Christians, but they don't know because they've never been taught. But our responsibility as followers of Christ is to be faithful to him. That's what he's talking about there, to be, be wary of what we do and how we live. But sometimes it's just easier just to go along. Now, I'm, I'm going to digress here for just a moment. I'm sure this never happens to anyone else in their life. Did you ever have a time when you were in school maybe or with a group of folks at work and you kind of gave in to doing something that you know you shouldn't have done but you did it anyway? It might have been making fun of a coworker, or making fun of a, your boss or, or, or a teacher or some other situation where you kind of just joined in with the crowd and you gave in to what we call peer pressure. I know you've never heard of that, right? And you just gave in in that moment and you, rather than being standing for who you, what you knew to be right, you did, with what, every, you did what everybody else did. Because sometimes you just want to go along to get along, right? That's an easy temptation for us. That's, that's a comfort because we don't really like, most of us generally don't want to cause waves in the midst of our friend groups, do we? Okay, I guess you do because you're really quiet. But I think that's probably a part of human nature. We like, how many of you enjoy being liked? Oh my goodness, really? There's five people in this entire audience. All right, thank you for being honest. Thank you. We like to be liked. I mean, none of us want to be hated. You know, if you go to somewhere where you are not liked, you're not going to go there very often again, are you? You know, I can remember there were times, and you know, my mom would tell me, you know, well, you need to go to this event at school. I'm like, I don't want to go because they don't like me. And she didn't understand this, but you should go because everybody's going. So? And she had this really weird idea. We, we had this thing, this is, this is really dumb. In middle school, we had dance classes that we did on Saturday nights. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. Yeah. They were teaching us different steps for dance. You had to pay extra for this. My, parent, my mother paid extra for this, and me and a couple of friends went because our mothers told us we had to go. And we learned how to waltz. Yeah. And, and other dances, you know, uh, that you learn. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on them. There's all these different dance steps, and we learned how to do them. We had a teacher, a lady. She had an interesting dress on, and her husband, they taught us all these dances. And you had about... I don't know, maybe 70, 80 of us middle school students out there, the ones that had nothing else to do on Saturday night. So that was us. I was one of those. And there we all are dancing and trying to learn these steps. And it was, and, and it was okay when you were just trying to do the steps, but then they made you pick partners. Yeah, you know where that's going. How well is that going to go? You know, because certain people get picked and then they're the rest of us, right? And we're just kind of like, yeah. Ah, and you kind of want, you wonder who's going to pick you. Is it going to be that person that you don't want to pick you? Because you're, you know, you don't realize as a middle school that your life, you think your life is set by whoever picks you to dance at a stupid thing on a Saturday night when it doesn't really matter. But at the moment, your world revolves around that because of your, I don't know, whatever. When we're that young, we just kind of have a shortened perspective to understand life. But I think as I, I think of that, that's, that's the way that it would be that gravitational peer pressure that would move in those situations that would cause someone to pick someone that maybe they didn't want to pick. Usually because you had to pick everybody. That was the good thing. See, because there was about, and it was about a pretty even number, but there, there were usually more girls than guys, so that was good for us guys. Not so much for the girls, but that was good for the guys because we were going to get picked eventually. And usually it was be ladies' choice was kind of how the lady worded it. You know, they get to choose. And so you just wonder who's going to pick you. So eventually you get picked, and you, but because but you, you want to fit in, you don't want to be one of those who didn't get picked. And we struggle with that throughout our lives, don't we? We think it's just something we deal with in adolescence. But even as adults, we struggle with that. We want to be liked. We want to be accepted. We want to be valued. But sometimes when we follow Christ, 
that will not be so. We're valued by God, but the world does not always appreciate and value the things of God, does it? There are sometimes when you are faithful to God, it will cause you to be at odds with the world in which you live. And these believers were dealing with that, and Peter understood that, and he wanted them to be faithful in spite of that, to stand the course and be ready to walk with God. And notice what he says in that last verse, in verse 19. This is going to take a little time on this one because there's just a lot here. Therefore, those who also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. When you suffer for doing what is right, when you follow God no matter what the consequences are, you are entrusting your soul, your life to him. You're saying, God, whatever happens to me is fine as long as I am faithful to you. We do this in other areas of our lives, and and I don't know why we get so caught up and getting upset and focused about this. We do it a lot of times in other areas, especially in relationships. Many of us have been a part of friend groups that we weren't all accepted and appreciated by everyone, or maybe in your own your relationship with your spouse. I'm going to pick on married people for a while, so some of you aren't married, you don't have to worry about that right now. But in that relationship, you choose that relationship, and because of that relationship that the two of you have, it's an exclusive relationship, and you have made that choice. And if you ever notice sometimes that people don't always like the choices you make, oh, yeah, I went there. They question them. What were you thinking? I'm sure a lot of people would ask my wife that, what she was thinking. But that happens sometimes in, in relationships, and it causes strife. I have a good friend who had some of that struggle in the relationship that he had with his spouse. Not that they had a problem, but the problem was with his in-laws. Well, that never happens, right? Boy, it's quiet in here today. And we see that kind of work out, not just in that, but in all arenas of life. We make those choices, and because of the choices that we make, there are consequences, there are relational issues, there are things that we have to struggle with. And why would we think it'd be any different that if we follow Christ, we're not going to be at odds with those who choose not to? I'm going to ask a goofy question, all right? No, it's not really goofy. It's just weird. Has there been a time in your life when it would have been easier for you to not let people know you were a Christian than it would be to let them know. And I, I guess really what I'm saying, is there times in life it'd be, it'd be better if you weren't a Christian? Certain situations? Because it'd be easier to get along if you're really, if no one knows. Now that happens obviously when we're younger, but as we get older and in work environments, when people don't see things the same way as we see, and especially in the culture, if you notice the culture in which we live is a lot more, uh, it's a lot more pluralistic than it was when I grew up. Because we've got a lot of different, we were talking about that this morning, a lot of different faith, faiths that are represented in the world in which we live. I grew up in a neighborhood pretty much where everybody was either Baptist, Lutheran, or Catholic. That was it. Those were your three choices. Or maybe you didn't go at all. And that's okay. But those were your four choices. You had four choices. That was it. How many choices take place in places in the neighborhoods where you live now? More than four, I'm going to guess. Way more. And you encounter people of different beliefs, the different understandings of life, completely different than anything you've ever, ever experienced. And you're trying to meld all that together and figure out, well, how does this all work together? That's one of the the things about the melting pot that is America. We, we bring everybody in, everybody, and everybody's of a variety of different groups. I learned this, I really, at the hospital, it was interesting for me because as chaplains, we had about uh, 12 different or so. I'm just throwing that number out there because there's a bunch of different faith groups that were represented. And people came from different perspectives. And when you're visiting patients, you know, that's one of the things you do as a chaplain. You're not trying, we're not there to convert or to, we're trying to listen and help. But you hear all kinds of worldviews and understandings about life. And, that's, and people, when people are going through stressful times, because anytime you're in the hospital, it's generally a stressful time, isn't it? If it's not, wait till you get your bill. But anyway, that's what's going to happen is that kind of stress. There's stress involved because your body's not doing what it's supposed to do, and you're there, and you don't want to be there generally. And so it was interesting to see how people dealt with that. I learned a lot in those 
couple years that I did that with the, at the hospital. Just a lot of different things. And those that work there and groups like that with the public, you see that. And you see how people respond to that and how they struggle with that. But as followers of Christ, we are called, as Peter says here, to just be faithful to God no matter what happens, no matter what it may cause. And sometimes that's difficult. You know, there was a time when being faithful to God meant somebody wouldn't like me. Or somebody wouldn't say, speak to me. But we live in a world now where being faithful to God may cost you your life. And in many parts of the world, that is the reality of it. And you know, one of the things that I experienced many years ago in, uh, as a campus minister is we had a, a, a group of students, and it was at a, co- a state school, and so they came from all over parts of the world, and we had a, we had a fun group. We even had a, a guy that, whose dad was a Unitarian pastor. It was great. And so, but we had all these different religious groups were represented, but one of the, the, the students that I really enjoyed spending a lot of time with was a young man whose family had lived in Iran before the Shah, when the Shah was there. You remember the Shah? Anybody, anybody old enough to remember the Shah of Iran? Okay, come on. I'm not the only old person here, right? Then the rest of you read about it in history. This is before all that whole stuff with the, the, the Ayatollah Khomeini and all that. And they were there at that time. He was a small child. He didn't remember a lot about it. I remember his parents telling him they had to leave that country when the Shah was overthrown because their faith was not the faith of what was about to happen. They were Christians. His parents were Christians, and they had to leave. And that's everything they knew. His dad had a good job. They were, you know, a happy family there. They thought things were going well. The Shah was overthrown. If any of you don't remember, you can read about this. There was a lot of violence, a lot of struggle. When the Islamic uh, extremists took over and the Ayatollah Khomeini and all that, you can read about it. It's been, it's been on the news. I'm not saying anything that's not happened. But that because of that, it created a great deal of stress. And many people left that part of the world went to other parts of the world. They chose to come to the United States. I don't know why. I have no idea. And he and his family found themselves halfway across the world in northwest Missouri. His dad got a job up that way. They were able to survive and and have a better life and moved out of that part of the world in the middle of that and got out just before that happened. But to think about that, that that was something you had to consider, that if you did not leave there, there was a very good chance you might go to prison or die. And the kind of life, I mean, that's something that is so foreign to my mind and hard for me to grasp. And yet, brothers and sisters, that is the plight of the majority of believers in Jesus Christ on this planet. They face that reality on a regular basis. I had another friend in, years ago that I worked with who was a missionary in a place known as Papua New Guinea. You may have heard of it. And as he was there, one of the things he got in the village that he was ministering to was you had to, the witch doctor was in charge. Now that to us sounds crazy. Have you ever been anywhere where the witch doctor wasn't, was the, anybody? Probably, I didn't think so. No, we don't go there. But he had been, and that was one of the things he had to learn was how to get along with the witch doctor because, and obviously, it wasn't get along for the sake of we're going to be buddies and friends. It was to help him understand what he was doing, and he had to build the bridges and build the relationships and learn a language and all that kind of crazy stuff that he did, he and his wife. But I, I remember him telling stories about how the witch doctor wanted to get him out of the village and how, you know, they lost three dogs because their dogs were bitten by co- cobras. Anybody had a cobra in your yard? I hope not, because that's the wrong part of the world, but it's not there. That's where they have them. And all this was to get him, he believes, and I think he has a good merit, was to get him to leave. They stayed there for the allotted time. I believe it was about four years. They were there. Yeah, I can imagine that. Facing that antagonism, they were faithful. They stayed true. They saw small groups of people come to Christ at times, not not a huge group, because most people believed in the teachings of the witch doctor. And that that was the religion of that community in that area. And they faced some significant opposition. And it was the first time in his life, because he, like me, grew up in the Midwest, where you don't experience anything like that. And so it was a foreign world to him. And as I think of him and I think of others like that around the world that face that, I wonder as we are here and we think in any discomfort we face, what's the first thing that we do when we face something that's not like we want it to be? We whine and complain, don't we? That's what we do. That's human nature. But yet that's 
what, is, what does Peter just say to do here? Rejoice. What did those guys do? Was, I said Acts 2, I meant Acts 5 is where that was with the, with the disciples that were, that rejoiced for being counted worthy to suffer for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Peter's wanting us to understand that that is just a part of it. And I just share that this morning. I don't know if it encourages you or what it does, or maybe thinks that I'm crazy or that, that we're all crazy for doing this, that that's a part of following Christ, that following Christ means sometimes people will not see things the way you see things. And sometimes there will be stress. There will be difficulty. There will be frustration. And there may even be a little bit of pain involved. But that's okay. Did Jesus endure, endure suffering for our salvation? That's, a, that's an easiest question I'll ever ask. Yeah. Did Jesus in, was Jesus misunderstood when he was on this planet? Absolutely. Still is today. Did people say things about him that were disparaging or hurtful? Absolutely. And yet he remained true to the mission which the Father had sent him to fulfill. And he calls us to do the same. So my prayer for us today as we walk away from this text and walk away from whatever God has taught us is that we choose to follow him and we choose to be faithful no matter what we encounter. Because ultimately, at the end of all things, whose opinion of our life is going to really matter? Who's the final judge of our life? God, right? Will it matter what they think about me at CNN? Or Fox News or anywhere like that for that matter? I don't care who you say. Does it even really matter what you think about me? No. No. Ultimately, no. It's all about what Christ thinks about me. My call to him and your call as well is to be faithful to him regardless of the cost in our lives. And that if I am counted worthy to suffer the sufferings of my, like my Savior suffered, then I should rather than whine and complain and try to find a way out of it because that's what I do when things don't go my way. I should just be counted like those disciples were, grateful that I was counted worthy to suffer for the sake of the gospel. People often ask, why doesn't the church today grow like it did in the book of Acts? They do ask that question. They wonder about that. And there's that discussion among pastors and others, you know, why are we not seeing what we saw in the book of Acts? And and brothers and sisters, I'm afraid it's because of that. That's one of the key issues. Is that we're more focused on our comfort and our security and our safety than we are our faithfulness. I'm going to let that just lie. What would it look like in the church of Jesus Christ today? What would it look like at Southern Baptist Church today if our main focus was not on what happens to us, what doesn't matter, is Jesus Christ glorified and exalted by the lives that we live? Or is it all about me? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for this time. I pray that you use this time in whatever desire and way that you want. And I pray, Father, that I've been faithful to communicate your word to your people today in a way that hopefully you're exalted and honored by. And Father, we just uh, ask your blessings upon this time. Just use it for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.